Hello. This video includes information on thermodynamics, enthalpy, and thermochemical equations. We're going to talk about chemical thermodynamics next. And when we deal with chemical thermodynamics, we're dealing with the relationship between heat, work, and other forms of energy in the context of chemical and physical processes. And when we look at internal energy, which can be um, symbolized with a capital U or a capital E, it's essentially the sum of all the possible energies present in the system. And when we use the word system, we're talking about what it is that we're studying. Everything else outside the system is considered to be the surroundings. So the change in internal energy can be brought about by two things. Okay, it can be brought about by heat being gained or lost by the substance. And it can be brought about by work either done to or by the system. And this is considered to be the first law of thermodynamics. So the change in the internal energy of a system is equal to the sum of the heat gained or lost by that system plus the work done either to or by the system. Okay, so here's our equation here. Okay, this is just the um, change in the internal energy equals the heat that's gained or lost plus the work that's done on or by the system. So Q for the system is the heat transferred to or from the system. W is the work done on or by the system. And we're always going to consider energy changes, energy flow in terms of the system. And oftentimes that becomes confusing because we typically measure the surroundings. And then we're just going to have to think about what happens to the system. So let's look at the two possibilities for Q. If Q is greater than zero, okay, that means Q is a positive value. The system is absorbing energy. So the system has more energy after the process that we're looking at uh, than it had before. Now, if Q is less than zero, meaning it's a negative value, it means the system has given off heat. So the amount of heat that the um, system has after the change is less than the amount of energy it had before the change. Now, looking at the Ws, okay, the work. If W is greater than one, it means that work is being done on the system by the surroundings. And if Q is uh, less than zero, or if Q or W is a um, negative value, that means work is being done by the system. So let's look at an example, okay? Whatever this is in here, this kind of green circle, this is the system that we're studying. Okay, everything outside it is the surroundings. Now, the system could be losing energy. Okay, Q could be negative. Or the system could be doing work on the surroundings. Either of those two variables would cause the internal energy of the system to go down, to become negative. Now, energy could be absorbed into the system or work could be done on the system 
And in that case, the uh, change in the internal energy would increase. So delta U would be a positive value. And there can be all kinds of combinations. We could have um, an exothermic process that's um, having work done on it, or we could have an endothermic process that's doing work to the surroundings. So there's all different combinations of Q and W. And again, it's always going to be relative to the system. And the sum of the heat being transferred plus the work being done on or by the system will determine the energy change within that system. So let's look at uh, an example. So it says, um, what is the change in internal energy? That means we're trying to calculate delta U. You could also see delta E, depending on the text that you're using. Um, that does 7.02 kilojoules of work and absorbs 888 joules of heat. So let's think about what this value for work means and what this value for heat means. And we know that the sum of those two values is going to be our uh, change in internal energy. So it says that um, the system does work. So work is done by the system to the surroundings. So the sign on W is going to be negative. And then when we look at the heat value Q, it says that the system is absorbing energy. So the Q value is going to be positive. And the only other thing we have to consider here is that the units aren't the same. We can't add kilojoules to joules. So we're just going to convert kilojoules to joules so that the units are the same. And then we can figure out the change in internal energy of the system. So delta U, okay, that's the change in internal energy equals Q which is positive 888 joules. Again, it's positive because the system is absorbing heat. Plus negative 7,020 joules. Again, we converted it to joules so that the units are consistent. And it's a negative sign because it tells us that um, the system is doing work on the surroundings. So the total change in internal energy for the system is going to be negative 6,132 joules, which we could change to kilojoules and say it's 6.132 kilojoules. If it doesn't designate what the units are, it doesn't really matter what units we convert to. They just have to be consistent. So when we talk about work, work is often done by expansion, which has to do with a combination of pressure and volume changes um, by the system. So let's say that we have a flammable gas that's in a piston. Okay, so here's our little picture of a piston. Here's our flammable gas here. Um, heat is produced. Okay, so we're looking at Q. And pressure is produced because we're producing more gas which is going to push on the piston, which means that work is being done by the system. And again, the system is the combustion of the flammable gas. Okay, that's what we're studying. So in this case, Q and W will both be negative. Okay, Q will be negative because heat is being given off when this gas combusts. And W will be negative because the system is doing work on the surroundings. The expansion work that's done can be calculated by taking negative P delta V, where P is the pressure and delta V is the change in volume. So the uh, change in the internal energy, 
okay, delta U is only dependent on, oops, sorry, I pushed the wrong button, trying to move something else, is only dependent on the starting energy that we have and the final energy that we have, not necessarily on how that change takes place. And we call this kind of behavior a state function. So let's look at an example that's not chemistry related before we talk about state functions in a little more detail. So let's say that we have um, this mountain here and we're trying to climb up the mountain. Okay, and if we were starting at the base and we wanted to go to the summit, um, that would be our change in altitude. But whether we go straight up the mountain or we zigzag up the mountain, doesn't matter. It's nearly the change between the beginning and the end point. Okay, that's what we mean when we talk about a state function. So although the paths and the path lengths are different, the altitude change is the same. Okay, that means that the altitude is an example of a state function. Okay, displacement is also a state function. Think about um, the lab that you did, I'm trying to remember which one it was now, I guess it was the density lab. Um, when you had um, a graduate cylinder and you put some liquid into the graduate cylinder and then you put the object into the liquid and you measured the change in volume or the displacement of water. It doesn't really matter what volume you start with um, or what volume you end with, you're talking about the difference between the initial and the final. In chemistry, pressure and volume are also state functions. Their changes don't depend on the path, just on the difference between the beginning and the end points. But heat and work are not state functions. So what can we do with that? We're gonna talk about what's called enthalpy. And enthalpy, and the symbol for enthalpy is an H, and I actually really don't know the reason why that is, other than it's talking about heat, um, but, and why it's not an E, I guess E is for energy, but enthalpy is H, and it's essentially the sum of the internal energy of a system and the product of its pressure and volume changes. So H, which is enthalpy, equals the internal energy of the system plus the pressure times the volume. And we're gonna kind of play around with this just a little bit algebraically. So U, okay, which is our internal energy, and P, which is our pressure, and V, which is our volume, our state functions, that means that enthalpy must be a state function as well. So enthalpy only depends on the initial and the final values for the internal energy, the pressure, and the volume. So we could just convert this a little bit and use our delta signs. Remember, that just means the change. So the change in enthalpy equals the change in the internal energy of the system plus the change in the pressure times the volume. All right, so let's say we have a constant pressure. What can we do with that? Well, delta H equals delta U plus delta P times V. We could distribute that delta sign into the parentheses. So we're gonna get delta PV plus P delta V. We're just distributing the delta sign here and we're distributing the delta sign here. If we're at a constant pressure, it means the pressure change is zero. So delta PV, this part of our equation, equals zero. So we can substitute that in. We've kind of simplified the equation a little bit. So at a constant pressure, delta H equals delta U plus P delta V. Now, let's incorporate in the other equations that we talked about. Well, delta U 
really equals Q times W. And W equals negative P delta V. So we're just gonna substitute uh, the heat plus the work in for delta U. And we're gonna substitute in W work for negative P delta V. So we're gonna get delta H equals our heat times the work minus the work, work cancels out. And we get Q at a constant pressure. So delta H, the enthalpy change for a system equals the heat that's given off or absorbed at a constant pressure. So if we were to look at a calorimeter, which we've talked about before, because the pressure is constant here, delta H will equal Q. So delta, so enthalpy or delta H is the heat flow at a constant pressure. But if we were to look at a bomb calorimeter, which we looked at before, pressure is not constant. So the change in enthalpy would not necessarily equal Q because we have to take into consideration the calorimeter itself. Let's look at how we can um, use all this information. So thermochemical equations show changes in both matter and energy. And we've written equations with just matter so far. Okay, we've dealt with chemical equations. So thermal equations incorporate in energy. So here's an example. If we were to take hydrogen and react it with oxygen to produce water, the delta H for this reaction is negative 286 kilojoules. Now, that's relative to this reaction. So it means for every mole of hydrogen that reacts, 286 kilojoules of energy are gonna be released. For every half a mole of oxygen that reacts, 286 kilojoules of energy are released. And for every mole of water that's produced, 286 kilojoules of energy are released. So this number is relative to this balanced equation. So let's say we were to change the balanced equation. Okay, let's say that we were to take this equation and multiply all the coefficients by two. So one times two gives us two, one half times two gives us one, one times two gives us two. Okay, we change the coefficients. We're gonna multiply the energy by that factor. So in this case, because we multiplied the coefficients by two, we're gonna multiply the energy by two, it's relative. So two moles of hydrogen would produce 572 kilojoules of energy and so forth through the reaction. So this number that we're given is relative to the coefficients in that particular balanced equation. Change the coefficients, we have to change the number by that factor. Now, let's say that we take the reaction and we flip it around. So we make hydrogen and oxygen the products and we make water the reactant. Well, if the reaction the way it's written up here is exothermic, okay, delta H is negative. If we flip the reaction around, the reaction is now endothermic. So if we produce one mole of water, we give off 286 kilojoules of energy. If we decompose one mole of water, we would have to absorb 286 kilojoules of energy. And if we had something other than like one mole of hydrogen, we could figure out how many moles do we have and do a stoichiometry problem to find out how much energy is being released. 
So here's an example. Consider the following reaction. So we have CH4, which is methane, and we're gonna react it with H2O, which is water, and we're gonna produce carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas, and this balanced equation is an endothermic reaction that gives off 206 kilojoules of energy. So I want you to try and figure out what if we were to change this reaction and instead of the coefficients being one, 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 three, we make them two, 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 six. Figure out what the delta H value would be for this reaction. We're doubling the coefficients. That means we need to double the energy, okay? And it's still endothermic. I really should put a positive sign there. So let's try another one. Let's say that we wanna find out the enthalpy change associated with this reaction. Notice the difference between the given reaction and this reaction and see if you can calculate what delta H would be for this new reaction. And the first thing we want to do is realize that we're not changing the coefficients, but we are flipping the reaction around. So flipping the reaction around, it was endothermic the way that it was written. The reverse reaction then must be exothermic. So let's look at this. We're going to add on a little bit. It says, how much energy would you release from the combustion of 4.0 grams of hydrogen with excess oxygen? Okay, so we're given the reaction and the way that it's written, it's exothermic and 572 kilojoules of energy are released for every two moles of hydrogen, one mole of oxygen and two moles of water but we don't have necessarily two moles of hydrogen. We don't know how many moles of hydrogen we have. So the first thing we're gonna need to do is a stoichiometry problem to convert from grams of hydrogen to moles of hydrogen. And there's 2.02 .02 grams per mole for hydrogen. And once we figure out the moles of hydrogen for every two moles of hydrogen that reacts, 572 kilojoules of energy are released. Now, it says excess oxygen. That's just telling us that all the hydrogen reacts. We don't really have to do anything with that part. It's just telling us this is the limiting reactant. It's all going to react, and it determines how much energy is being produced. So think about what you need to do. You need to change 4.0 grams of H2 to moles. And then the balanced equation tells us it's two moles of hydrogen for every 572 kilojoules of energy. Okay, see if you can work that out. And again, I really do want you to actively be working on these problems. Um, you know, watching me do it kind of looks easy until you have to do it yourself. So try and do the problems on your own and then check and see what you did with what I do and then ask questions if they're not exactly the same. Keep in mind that it's two moles of hydrogen for every 572 kilojoules of energy. Four moles of hydro, I didn't write that part, did I? Geez, where'd that go? Oops, I don't know what I did. Um, you know what, that might be a typo, actually. That would be unfortunate. Um, that is a typo. It says grams there and it says moles there. So let me work it out on my paper. So 4.0 grams of H2, 2.02 uh, .02 grams, one mole, two moles of H2, 572 kilojoules, Sorry, I was trying to make an easy question and then a harder question. So four divided by 2.02 .02 times 572 divided by two. Yep, 570, I agree. Good, negative 570, I agree. Um, that's not what this problem is, there's a typo. If this number had been four moles of hydrogen, then we would just say there's two moles for every 572 kilojoules. Sorry, that's, that's a typo, that's unfortunate. So let's look at another one. All right, so now this one will be legit. 
we've got 15.0 grams of hydrogen. And we want to figure out how much energy. Like you did on the last one. Take 15.0 grams of hydrogen and convert that to moles. Then it's a two moles of hydrogen for 572 kilojoules of energy and see how much energy is being produced. And think about this, you have much more than one mole of hydrogen, actually you have much more than two moles of hydrogen. So you're gonna be producing more than 572 kilojoules of energy. So we've got, um, 15.0 grams of hydrogen. Remember that hydrogen is diatomic. So there's 2.02 grams of hydrogen for every mole of hydrogen. And then the balanced equation tells us for every two moles of hydrogen that reacts, 572 kilojoules of energy are released. So we're gonna get negative 21, 24 kilojoules but we only have three significant digits here. So we would round this to negative 2120. And then, uh, so we could write it as uh, 2.12 times 10 to the third kilojoules, just to make it a little easier. All right, so here's another one. This time we've got nitrogen gas reacting with oxygen gas to produce nitrogen monoxide. And based on this reaction, it's endothermic. Again, I should really have a positive sign here. And it's 181 kilojoules of energy per mole of reaction, the stoichiometry of reaction. So how many grams of nitrogen would be made to react with um, if the enthalpy change is 49.2 kilojoules. So this time your starting point is 49.2 kilojoules. The balanced equation enables you to go from kilojoules of energy to moles of nitrogen that reacts. And then you can go from moles of nitrogen to grams of nitrogen, which is what you're asked for. And if you don't have a periodic table right in front of you, nitrogen is 14.01 grams per mole and nitrogen is diatomic. So 28.02 is the molar mass for nitrogen gas, 28.02. Think about what you need to do. What are you given? And what are you going to need to do to get to what you need? Convert kilojoules to moles and then moles to grams. So 49.2 kilojoules, it tells us there's 181 kilojoules per mole of nitrogen in the reaction. So that's where this part of our stoichiometry comes from. And then one mole equals 28.02 grams. So 7.62 grams of nitrogen gas.